Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Crime Surveys User Conference. So we have first session, which is the, um, the updates, and our first speakers today are giving a talk about the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey. And they are Anna Saunders, Katrina Coldwell, and Jocelyn Hickey from the Scottish Government. So Anna Saunders has been leading the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey team in Justice Analytical Services in the Scottish Government since 2019. She's a government social researcher with prior experience in a range of other UK government departments. departments. Jo Hickey is a social researcher working with the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey team. Her primary focus is on the pre-procurement of the survey. And Katrina Coldwell is a statistician in the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey team. And her work recently has mainly focused on developing the methodology for returning to field work following the COVID-19 suspension of the survey. Okay then, so over to you then, Anna. Thanks very much, Sarah. And hello, everyone. It's good to be joining you. Hopefully you can see uh, the slides okay and can hear me as well. Yes, I can see you and hear you. Brilliant. That's good to know. Um, OK, so today, uh, Katrina, Joe and I will be presenting and updating roughly in three parts. Uh, I will start with a brief overview and background to the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey pre-COVID-19. I will then hand over to Katrina, who will talk more about how COVID-19 has affected the survey. And Joe will close with an update on re-procuring the next SCGS contract and the future of crime surveying in Scotland. So as I say, I'll just start with a quick overview of how the SCGS has been run up until March 2020. And hopefully this will provide some context for the time series and also um, where we were starting from when we needed to make adaptations to the survey during the pandemic. So looking back, typically the SCGS is an annual survey of around 5,500 adults aged 16 and over living in private households in Scotland. The sample is designed to be representative of all private residential households across Scotland and that's including Highland and Island communities for which a random, um, a systematic random uh, selection of private residential addresses is typically produced from the Royal Mail's postcode address file and allocated in batches to interviewers. And to note here, the survey doesn't provide information on crimes against adults living in other circumstances, for example, tourists and those living in institutions or communal residents such as hospitals and student accommodation. The survey also excludes crimes against businesses. The design of the survey has been broadly similar since 2008-09 uh, up to 2019-20. Uh, and as this slide illustrates, has been completed face to face in the homes of respondents with sections or more sensitive topics completed by the respondent themselves using the responder's laptop or tablet as part of the main interview. And the SCGS is primarily a victimisation survey which captures information on adults experiences of violent and property crime, including those not reported to the police. It also asks adults about their perceptions of crime, the police uh, and the justice system in Scotland. And we collect information on more sensitive topics on drug use, stalking and harassment, partner abuse and sexual victimisation by a self-completion element of the survey. Data collected by the self-completion element of the SCGS is collated over two years, uh, two survey years and published biennially with the latest results available for 2018-19 and 2019-20 combined, which we published back in March. So I'll just hand over now to Katrina to talk more about developments since COVID-19. Okay, I'll carry on for now just while um, Katrina uh, tries to join. I have to apologise, I haven't uh, prepared any speaking notes for this, so um, it may not be as, as smooth as the presentation Katrina would have given. Um, so um, yes, going back to uh, March 2020 um, and the, uh, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, meaning that all face-to-face in-home uh, interviews were suspended. Um, and so Bye. we then went through, oh yeah, I'll carry on for now. Um, 
So yes, March 2020, um, suspension of base at, at the point where we needed to suspend uh, interviewing on the SCGS, we then um, needed to undergo um, a period of rapid redevelopment to think about how we would be able to meet the evidence gap that opened up as a result of that suspension where um, the SCGS forms that kind of crucial piece of evidence where uh, we are capturing crimes which are not reported to the police and therefore uh, data sources like police recorded crime cannot provide an alternative. So that really was our main aim to capture victimization. Um, and so we developed a telephone survey uh, using our recontact sample of SCGS respondents from the previous two years who had agreed to be recontacted for further research. So there were a few kind of key differences really between um, the SCGS and the new and standalone um, Scottish victimisation telephone survey. One of those being uh, clearly that the interview was uh, shortened to 20 minutes compared to an average of 40 minutes for the SCGS. Um, and instead of interviews running continuously through the year, as is the case for the SCGS, they ran uh, from uh, September through to October with that smaller sample, achieved sample size of 2,654. Uh, and clearly with the change in mode as well, we saw that play out in response rate as you would expect. So um, a response rate of 39%. And so we were very clear in the, in the sort of um, uh, production of the statistics and the communication of those statistics that the results were not going to be comparable to the SCGS. But to overcome that, we um, asked questions that were very specific to the pandemic um, and also um, had elements which were comparable to the equivalent telephone crime survey for England and Wales. So um, the next few slides just run through some of the, uh, some of the results that we found. Um, and so this gives a sort of an overview of what the SVTS tells us about crime in Scotland. Um, and you can see that um, sort of uh, to be expected that 39% of, um, of crime occurred uh, after the start of the UK's first national lockdown on the 23rd of March and 61% in the period before the lockdown. And this was actually where the, um, the survey was really interesting because we retained that 12 month reference period uh, where people recall experiences that they've had. But because of the timing of the interviews, it meant that we had uh, six months pre first national lockdown and six months post. So it gave us some really interesting comparisons in that way. Um, so other findings uh, relating to uh, perceptions of crime, safety and policing since the virus outbreak uh, just over half of people, 54% felt that crime in their local area had stayed about the same since the start of the pandemic, uh, uh, since the start of the UK's first national lockdown on the 23rd of March. Um, other findings included um, sort of stepping away from the victimisation element and more towards perceptions of crime, safety and policing since the virus outbreak. Um, for example, 87% of adults reported no change in how safe they were feeling walking alone in their local area after dark since the virus outbreak. And these slides will be available as well, so you can have a look at the, uh, the detail in there in your own time after the conference. Um, and then I think just finally on um, uh, findings from the SBTS, we also asked questions relating to um, crime safety and policing since the um, virus outbreak. So one of the findings there, 74% of people were satisfied with the way the police in their local area were responding to the virus outbreak. So providing um, that information that was really specific to the pandemic where we couldn't rely on the time series. So um, just very briefly, because I know that um, we're starting to run out of time and I want to make sure we get through to the next section. The return of the SCGS. So we're now back in field, which is very exciting. Uh, and we are doing things slightly differently, well, very differently now. Um, so we're now operating a mixed mode format um, where uh, an interviewer will send out the letter with all the details of the, um, 
of the survey and how the interview um, will work. The interviewer then knocks on the door and this is referred to as knock to nudge and a telephone or a video interview is offered. Um, at the moment, we're not offering a face-to-face -face interview, but at, um, at the stage where uh, it's considered safe to do so, and appropriate to do so in uh, the Scottish context, then we will be making that an option as well. But there will still be the phone and video um, interview options as well. Um, and again, the self-completion where that would normally be uh, completed by the interviewer using the by the interviewee using the interviewer's uh, tablet. Uh, this is now um, being made available for completion via web and paper. Um, and again, at a stage where face-to-face -face interviewing returns, we would then be offering the in-home on tablet completion method. So I will just hand over now to uh, Joe. hopefully uh, will be with us and to talk us through the re-procurement of the SCGS. Uh, very busy time for us in the team at the moment, um, alongside getting the, um, the field work back up and running for the 21-22 survey year. We are also undergoing a re-procurement process. So, this is the last year of surveying under the current contract that we have with Ipsos Mori and uh, Napsen. Um, and so we now need to um, uh, work on re-procuring that contract with a timescale of going out to tender in spring 2022, letting the contract in October and field work uh, starting under the new contract in spring 2023. Um, with the first set of results being published in early 2025. And this is a really involved uh, process which is involving uh, a number of uh, different projects. Um, and um, our goal essentially written here on this slide is for this re-procurement process to be transparent and publicized, informed by the evidence, including expert and expert opinion and advice to respond to the needs of users and to align with the priorities of the Scottish Government. And here just want to emphasise the importance of user and stakeholder engagement in terms of an input for informing uh, what we are doing next on the survey. And it's really a time and an opportunity to reimagine crime surveying in Scotland and to kind of set the tone for the next four to six years. Um, so yeah, very exciting stuff. Uh, we've got a consultation which is live at the moment and I really want to flag this because um, it's got a few more days left to run so there's definitely still time to be submitting response. I think it closes on the 9th of December um, and the way that we've structured this consultation is by a number of themes for feedback which you can see on um, the slide and hopefully this really kind of gives a flavour of the fact that we're up for revisiting, discussing um, and challenging pretty much every aspect of the survey as we know it at the moment. Um, and one of the things which may be of kind of particular interest to this group is uh, the SCGS and further research. So how the SCGS can be more conducive to, um, to the research which others may be doing. Um, and uh, our kind of engagement doesn't stop with the consultation. So we just wanted to um, flag and let people know that we have um, user workshops coming up in, in January and uh, they will be informed by the themes emerging from consultation responses and discussions that we've been having with users to date. And these are the three um, emerging themes um, at the moment in terms of how we may structure those workshops. So the first is on options appraisal, which is really about continuing that discussion that we've been having over the last year, almost two years in terms of how we adapt the survey, given the new uh, context that we find ourselves in with the pandemic and really making sure that we're future proofing the survey. The second is around, again, how we can um, uh, focus on our kind of ongoing user engagement, how we can be most um, uh, helpful to those who use our data. And then the third is on questionnaire development, which um, will recap on what we've been hearing 
and talk about what work we'll be taking forward over the next few months. So yeah, that's the final slide there, which just gives a bit of information about how you can um, get in touch and get involved. So um, please do consider uh, submitting a response to our consultation or just reaching out and sending us in an email. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Great. OK, so we will move on now then to the next um, talk. So the next two talks are about the Crime Survey for England and Wales. Um, the first one is an update on the latest data and findings by Catherine Grant. Um, Catherine is responsible for the management of the Crime Survey at the ONS. And she recently joined the ONS team, having been involved in the survey for a number of years at Cantar, overseeing the development of the 10 to 15 survey and the introduction of measures of fraud and computer misuse. OK, then, so over to you. So, yeah, I'm Kath Grant, um, just responsible for the management of the survey at ONS. Um, I'm here to give an update on the crime survey and the work that we've been doing over the last year and very short term developments. And then I'll hand over to Joe, who will be talking about longer term transformation work. Um, so I just wanted to run through a general update to the survey um, and then really start to look at the detail of the telephone operated crime survey, the TCSEW. We published the annual update in July this year, showing the, the first estimates really for the for the full year from that. Wanted to touch briefly on comparability with previous face-to-face -face estimates before returning uh, to face-to-face -face interviewing um, and plans and an update on how that is going. Um, and then I'll just give a quick update at the end on microdata access. So, as you're probably aware, the face-to-face -face fieldwork for the crime survey was suspended on 17th of March 2020, obviously due to the pandemic. Um, we'd interviewed 33,735 adults at that point, um, and the response rate was 64%. So overall, apart from a slight shortfall in the interview numbers and response rate, the impact on the survey estimates from COVID has been pretty minimal for the 1920 year. Um, so we were able to sort of do a normal publication for that 1920 year. We wanted to try and find another way um, to produce the crime survey estimates, obviously, in that period when we weren't able to do face-to-face -face interviewing. So the telephone-operated crime survey was launched on the 20th of May as an interim measure to provide those headline crime estimates. That sample was formed from respondents who'd previously participated in the face-to-face -face crime survey in the last two years and who'd agreed to be recontacted for research purposes. It operates as a panel survey, so re-interviewing respondents at three monthly interview intervals. So the sample size was approximately 3,200 households per month. Um, at wave one, we ask all respondents about crime they've experienced in the last 12 months. And then at wave two and subsequent waves, we ask about crimes experienced since the last interview. So that's broadly speaking, a three month reference period used from there on. We're currently on wave six um, of the telephone survey, and we expect to continue that interviewing up until the end of March 2022. So I've just listed out here the current sample design. So we chose a panel design to try and maximize the sample, obviously, because of GDPR, we were only able to use respondents who'd taken place in the who'd taken part in the survey in the last two years. So we had quite limited numbers for people that we were able to recontact. We wanted to try and make as best use of that as possible. We felt that the three monthly interview intervals were the best best option for conducting those waves. Um, and then the first annual update was published in July 2021, and I've just listed here the spread of interviews across the year that were included in that update. I think one thing to note from the TCSEW estimates for 2020 to 21 is that they can't be compared with the 2019 to 20 face-to-face -face survey and that's due to the overlap, overlapping reference periods. I'm going to come on a bit later to talk in more detail about those overlapping reference periods. I'll just hold that for now. But it is worth, when you're looking at TCSEW data, there are a couple of notes on com comparability that need to be considered. So the population of the study is restricted to those aged 18 years and over. Overlapping data periods mustn't be used for the main estimates of crime. 
and the threat and harassment screener question needs to be removed from both the current and comparator years when you're using the data. So I mentioned earlier the TCSEW survey was set up really its main purpose was to provide the estimates of crime and to make sure that we were able to still produce those estimates throughout the pandemic. That meant that our, that was our, our focus and it meant that some of the detail um, and some of the modules from the survey had to be cut to make sure we could have a shorter questionnaire. Um, the set, survey itself was set up in a six week period and the telephone survey needed to be shorter than the face to face um, interview. As you'll no doubt be aware, it's obviously much harder to maintain engagement with a respondent on a, on a long telephone interview than it is when you've got that face-to-face -face rapport that's built up. So the telephone survey questionnaire was shorter than the face-to-face -face survey. It was just 25 minutes compared with the, the average of 50 minutes that we have for the face-to-face -face survey. And as a result, that meant that we were unable to include a lot of the survey questions that you're used to seeing on the face-to-face -face survey. In addition, the 10 to 15 year old survey was suspended and we're not planning to relaunch that until April 22 um, on the face-to-face -face survey. So just thinking about what was on that shortened questionnaire, we what we included was the household box, so picking up the relationships of people in the household, the screener module, although that, in, that excluded the screener question that asked about sexual victimization, and then there was a change made to the um, threats screener, which I'll come back to in a moment. We then used a very shortened um, victim form for both traditional and fraud and computer misuse offences. And that shorter victim form was designed, again, to focus solely on being able to classify offences. So a lot of the detail that you might be used to seeing from the victim form wasn't included. We included a new module covering concerns about crime in the COVID-19 context, and then the usual sort of demographic module was included as well. I think one key point is that the self-completion modules were not included in the telephone survey. And that's been one of the key driving factors in our thinking around sort of pushing to restart face-to-face um, -face interviewing as soon as we're able to. So I mentioned briefly the changes to the harassment question. At the end of the screener module, or towards the end, there's a threat screener question. We changed the wording on this question to include harassment. And that was really to try and fill a gap in the survey that's been there that we, we're aware it's a gap and we wanted to try and take this opportunity to plug that. And um, so I've just put the wording up here. So we've, um, the wording was, and apart from any anything you've already mentioned, in that time, has anyone threatened, harassed or intimidated you in a way that was intended to cause you alarm or distress? So the consequences of changing the wording for the TS TCSEW screener question were much bigger than we'd envisaged at the start. It's quite a minor change to the wording, but actually it ended up increasing the number of offences that were captured across a range of offence types. So in particular, estimates of violence without in injury. So for anyone who's not that familiar with how the crime survey operates, we ask a range of screener questions, which then sort of trigger a more detailed victimization module for each incident that the respondent has mentioned at that screener section. The classification of the offenses comes then from that more detailed victimization module. So what we were seeing was that the yes answers to the th threats and harassment question were generating more victim forms and they weren't necessarily always being classified then as threats or harassment, but were also classified as other types of crimes. So looking at the analysis, we realized that both the comparator year, so the year ending March 2019, and the TCSEW survey year would be more comparable if we rem removed all offences resulting from the original screener question and those from the new screener question in the TCSEW. Although that does mean that it's an underestimate of the true level of crime. So you'll see from our publications that we produce two estimates there. We have a total estimate of crime and we provide a separate appendix table which is comparing with the year ending 2019.
looking now at how to use the TCSEW data, as I've said, the main measures of crime are broadly comparable provided the estimates are on the following basis. So the population of the study being restricted to those aged 18 years and over. And that's because we were using the recontact sample. So the minimum age for people that would have taken part in the crime survey in the face-to-face -face version was 16. So obviously when we came to recontact them for the TCSEW survey, they would have got older and we had no way of refreshing that sample to bring younger people in. So that's why we need to restrict the population to those aged 18 years and over. We have overlapping data periods that mustn't be used for the main estimates of crime. And as I've just talked through, the threat to harassment screen in question needs to be removed um, from both the current and the comparator years for the main estimates of crime. The other key thing about using the TCSEW data is estimates obviously based on interviews rather than respondents, as we see in the CSEW. So the result of that is that standard errors on the TCSEW are much higher than those that we've seen on the CS, C, sorry, C, CSEW um, because they're based on re-interviewing the same person rather than interviewing that person just once only. So really the effect is that the TCSEW has a stronger cluster effect on the sample and the, and the larger standard error once the original sample strata and the primary sampling units are considered in that. So drawing a sample based on those previous respondents does mean that the sample isn't unique. It's a subset of the households or individuals that we selected in that original sample. Under normal circumstances, the crime survey sample is based on a unique sample of individuals which changes from year to year. So that means one survey year can be compared with the next. So that's not possible for the TCSEW because we'd end up potentially double counting in incidents that are in that overlapping reference period. Because, and that's only because the samples are not unique over those time periods. Hopefully, um, this graph, this chart illustrates this a little better. So if you look here, we've got month of interview down the side um, and the referen reference period dates along the top of the chart. And you can see the shaded boxes here are the reference periods. So if you look at the bo bottom chart, you can see that the if you were doing an interview in July 2020, you can see that the shading there overlaps with the shade, shading from the previous year. So you would have had potentially the respondent or the, the same incident included in both reference periods. So that's why we've had to use um, the earlier comparator year rather than using the, um, the just the prior year. For further information, the year ending March 21 publica publication is available on the website. We've also produced a comparability study, which is really interesting, I think, although I'm a bit biased, um, but definitely worth the read to look at the differences um, across the face-to-face -face survey and the telephone survey. And I've just put a link here as well to the latest quarterly publication um, that was published um, at the end of October. So obviously, um, over the summer, the restrictions around COVID started to ease. Um, and with that, we've started to look at a return to face-to-face -face interviewing. As I said, one of the main driving factors around that return to face-to-face -face interviewing is the fact that we've not been able to include the um, self-completion modules, which include the drugs, sexual victimization, and domestic abuse modules. And we think we've we're very keen to be able to get back to producing those statistics. So we resumed face-to-face -face interviewing in October 2021. I think it's fair to say that the return to face-to-face -to -face is definitely experimental at this stage. There are quite a number of unknowns um, that we're waiting to see how that pans out during fieldwork. So obviously we don't know how willing the public will be to participate in in-home research again. Similarly, how willing interviewers will be to be back out working, uh, knocking on doors and conducting in-home interviews. And as we've seen over this weekend as well, we're starting to see new COVID variants coming up. So I think the future within the next six month period is still quite uncertain about how successful the return to face-to-face -to -face will be. 
Um, but we're looking at trying to hopefully be able to produce some estimates based on that six month data, but definitely being in a good position to continue with the face to face interviewing um, from April 2022. And as I mentioned, in April 2022, we then also plan to relaunch the child survey, which we haven't launched on this sort of experimental return to face-to-face -face field work. So I just wanted to give a brief update on the latest results from the survey. So for the year ending June, 2021, um, what we saw this year was a 12% increase in total crime. That was largely driven by a 43% increase in fraud and computer misuse. Um, we did see a 14% decrease in total crime, excluding fraud and computer misuse, and that was generally driven by 18% decrease in theft offences. There was little change overall in the total number of incidents of violence, but a 27% decrease in the number of victims of violent crime and largely driven by falls in violence where the offender was a stranger. And that's in part reflecting the closure of the nighttime economy for several months of that year. So when we reported the differences, what was quite interesting is fraud and computer misuse offences don't follow the lockdown related pattern of reduced victimisation. So increases in those offences actually more than offset the reductions that we've seen in other types of crime. So what we've seen is a 32% increase in fraud incidents, largely driven by substantial in increases in both consumer and retail fraud and advanced fee fraud, and an 85% increase in computer misuse incidents driven entirely there by an increase in unauthorised access to personal information, including hacking. Just a brief update on the data sets. So the 1920 data set is now available in the data archive and we're planning to deposit the 2020 to 21 data to the SRS and UKDA um, by early 2022. But that will be the non-victim file only. Um, I mentioned earlier that our focus in across the TCSEW has been producing the files that enable us to get the crime survey estimates out. So the structure of the TCSEW victim files is quite complex. What we're planning to do with those files is to wait until the, that survey is completed, so at the end of March, and we'll then deposit the full data um, once we've had a chance to edit those data files and make sure that they're you know, appropriate for use. At the moment, I think the structure would be very difficult to work through. But our, I think our recommendation will be that they wouldn't, wouldn't recommend wider use of those files really for the victim files. Um, but that's our plan is to pull them all together into a single set of files and, and put them in later on in 2022. And we're currently just working through the remaining historic data sets for resupply following the change in methodology for handling repeat victimization. And we expect those to be available in the data archive in January 2022. So that's all from me. Um, let's move on then to Joe's talk. Joe is going to be giving a talk about the future plans for the crime survey for England and Wales. And Joe, over the last 20 years, has worked on and developed a number of household surveys for government. This includes the Labour Force Survey, the Annual Population Survey and the Crime Survey for England and Wales. Um, Joe managed the Crime Survey for England and Wales for the last 10 years and is now responsible for the future development of the survey. Before I start, um, given the presentation just on the future plans and survey development, I was just, I was just thinking about the last two presentations and, and just reflecting on one of the things and what it might mean for the future development of victimization surveys and as we all know or, or at least those of us that are familiar um, certainly with the crime survey for england and wales uh, we know that the survey is operated using um, um, like a, a similar approach um, and and the same mode of interview certainly for for at least the last 20 years uh, and that's, of course, until the pandemic hit. Um, uh, and, and then it, it triggered a, a necessary transition uh, to a different mode and, and, and to telephone survey operation, which, which happened similarly for both um, the Crown Survey for England and Wales and, and the Scottish Survey. And 
we also heard from Kat's presentation as well that that we're returning to face to face um, interviewing, and that's for, for very good reason, really. Um, um, you know, collecting domestic abuse and sexual assault testaments uh, and, so, and so on. Um, but I do wonder whether the days of single mode face-to-face -face surveying uh, are actually over. And, and I think it's, it's worth reflecting on the fact that multimodal interviews um, appeared more robust during the pandemic uh, than those that, that weren't, that was, were single mode. And, and in particular, I'm thinking of the... Um, the, the American National Crime Victimization Survey, the NCBS. It, it's interesting that the American survey re-interviews people repeatedly every six months for up to three and a half years. Uh, they conduct the first interview primarily face to face and then they follow it up by telephone. Uh, and, and as a result, it was, it was very much easier for them to, 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 to react um, to the COVID pandemic and what, what struck me is that it's notable that in effect the crime survey for England and Wales and indeed the Scottish survey moved pretty much in line with the NCBS and, and, and for the pandemic basically um, we took the sample of previous respondents to the crime survey for England and Wales face-to-face -face interview uh, and then conducted telephone interviews so if you think about it, it isn't really that much different to the American multimodal model um, and, and panel survey um, kind of design, um, which I think is, is certainly interesting um, and worth reflecting on, really. Um, anyway, it, it, was, it was just a thought that struck me. Um, about the last two interviews. Okay, so just moving on then um, to this survey. So what am I going to do? Um, well, it was about four years ago we started doing some development work um, around the transformation um, uh, of the crime survey. Um, it was a part of a wider programme, social survey transformation. Um, and we did some work looking at um, 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 self-completion and, and the main screen of questions. So I just wanted to mention some of the uh, original work that we've been doing uh, around moving the survey uh, online, certainly before uh, the pandemic hit. And maybe there was a couple of other small pieces of research that were, were going on um, alongside the pandemic. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just going to talk a little bit about those as well. The interesting thing about the pandemic itself, of course, is that in the way it, it was it was almost like a, a live experiment in itself with, with, with looking at alternative um, modes of, of interviews for, for, for victimization surveys and um, so I just on that I just want to reflect a little bit as well in the presentation on, on things that, that we that we might have, have learned uh, in relation um, to victimization surveys from the pandemic and how we reacted to them um, in fact, the thing I was saying earlier was probably similar to that. Anyway, uh, and then the last few things I want to do is just to say what the next phase is uh, uh, that we're going to conduct in, in terms of research and what are the factors affecting that research. And maybe then just maybe touch and maybe we can have a discussion about this, about what a future survey might possibly look like. OK, so. I think there was there's three notable pieces of work that, that we did um, 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 over the last few years. The first one was the um, uh, redesign of the crime survey core questions for online collection. Um, the second bit of work that we did was on the ethics uh, of online uh, data collection relating to um, the sensitive topics that, that we usually ask in, in, in the self-completion modules. And then also some, some, some research that we've done on, on, on domestic abuse statistics, all of which are very much uh, affecting uh, how, how um, the future survey may operate. So just touching on that first then, the, the investigating um, 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 the approach for adapting core sections of the crime survey uh, for mixed mode uh, data collection 
particularly uh, online. Uh, in February 2017, Kantar uh, was commissioned to undertake a, a three-stage scoping, uh, scoping and uh, testing project. And it was a very large programme of work, which included, uh, amongst other research, um, 99 in-depth interviews uh, um, um, with people uh, on, the, uh, on a, a slightly redesigned um, crime survey um, instrument. And what we were doing is just seeing whether that complex initial part uh, and key part of the, the crime survey, the screener questions and the victim forms, those bits which derive the main estimates of crime in the previous 12 months, whether that complex part of the survey could actually indeed operate uh, in an online environment without an interviewer being present to, to help and assist. And so the conclusions really came that the test script did provide uh, data of, of sufficient quality uh, to assign offence codes uh, in all cases. So, so you, you, you could ask questions where you could actually get a good description of the offence and, and, and be able to, co to code it. The main issue related to complex cases and, and to two things really. Um, one was that somebody who fell victim to um, multiple or, or repeat victimization um, um, found it difficult to to um, uh, actually indicate how many numbers of incidents that took place and, and, and became confused and also with with uh, single incidents which involved multiple features uh, of crime were susceptible to double counting as well so rather than uh, following the primary offence rule as we did in uh, 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 as the counting rules do people will be start recording multiple uh, crimes uh, uh, at that point leading to i mean which was really is really problematic and um, anyway and so the, the recommendations from that piece of work was that, that more testing should take place uh, especially um, uh, on, on, on comp these kind of more complex scenarios and that of course that we should do more investigation to other modules and, and, and other parts of the survey uh, instruments uh, in, including um, sexual assault from the self-completion module. So in light of that, we then um, started to do some work um, in early 2020, um, um, looking at the ethics of, of moving the crime survey data collection online, um, assessing the risks to the physical, emotional and psychological well-being of respondents uh, when they're, they're asked questions on these topics. And uh, we did this work in early 2020 with 25 in-depth interviews, uh, which were conducted with victim survivors of, 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 of domestic abuse, sexual victimization, uh, stalking uh, and abuse uh, in childhood, all of those things, which we, those characteristics, which we, we collect on, on the self-completion module. And I think it's probably in summary, I think it's fair to say that it was a mixed picture. Um, it was some of it was very positive. Uh, there were also some negative impacts on respondents' well-being uh, and the data quality. Um, and I think importantly, it, it concluded that while many victim survivors would be able to weigh up the risks of responding to the survey, it's actually impossible to estimate the extent to which such risks might occur. And that you know you have to consider the possibility of serious harm being caused to an to an online respondent should a perpetrator of one of the crimes uh, you know of interest that some that become aware of their participation uh, in the survey and um, so that was i think that was probably one of the key conclusions to that piece of work although I, as i said there was no clear argument either for or against uh, proceeding with further work looking into it we then moved on in, in autumn 2020 we put up a research tender which was which was won by the university of bristol uh, to take to 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 look at the uh, redevelopment of domestic abuse statistics um, in relation to uh, and specifically to explore the issues with the current survey questions and data collected uh, alongside user requirements and, and to investigate the use of alternative survey modes uh, to ask respondents 
about the experiences uh, of domestic abuse. Um, there are a number of issues with the data currently collected. Um, mainly, um, it, it's because they don't align with the definition of domestic abuse, which was introduced in the Domestic Abuse Act of 2021. Um, they also exclude uh, offences of coercive and controlling or controlling behaviour uh, introduced in 2015. Um, they don't measure the number of incidents or the frequency of abuse. Uh, and there's also uh, um, um, uh, um, more data is required to, to understand the, the nature of the, the abuse that takes place. Um, so the top three conclusions, there were a number of conclusions, um, um, but the top three conclusions in relation to that was that the headline prevalence measure of abuse should be revised and improved. Um, the survey should measure coercive control following robust questionnaire development and testing, and, and that there should be a measurement of impact of, 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 of abuse, uh, domestic abuse. And then one of the other ones, interesting, was, was that consideration should be given to the feasibility of a move to a long-term online delivery as the preferred primary data collection mode <coughs> for, for domestic abuse data. So a slightly different con conclusion to the work that previous uh, that Kantar had done previously. So that was all the work that was ongoing just before or around the time of the telephone. We switched to the telephone operated crime survey um, due to the pandemic. So what are the lessons learned from that? Well, one of the th first things is, is a shorter interview length. So we reduced the number of victim phone questions required for the, for the estimation process of crimes in the previous 12 months. So you, uh, you can rationalise the survey down a bit. Um, you can make it a, a bit more efficient. Um, and, and that was certainly done. And, uh, 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 and for a multimodal interviews going forward, of course, face-to-face -face interview, the crime survey face-to-face -face interview is quite long. And you, again, we heard from both Scotland and, and from Kath as well on the, the survey that when we, when the crime survey switched to the telephone survey operation, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a need to reduce the length of the survey. And of course, that's an issue going forward, of course, because if, if you do move to a multimodal operation in the future, and then, then, then the length of the survey has to reduce and the amount of information collected has to reduce as well. Um, the face-to-face -face random sample design <coughs> was set aside in favour of a recontact sample. So it was based on those who previously taken part in the face-to-face -face survey over the last two years. It had low attrition rates, really, and, and, and very agri high agreement to recontact rates. I mean, okay, these were people who responded to the survey in previous two years. Um, uh, there was a recontact question added. The response rate at wave one, so when we first started re-interviewing, <coughs> was 50%, which is pretty good, really. I think, you know, we weren't recruiting them to a panel survey. We haven't specifically said that we were going to be conducting multiple interviews with them. Um, so a 50% uh, response rate was great. The agreement to recall across all the waves over <coughs> the following year was 98% consistently. Uh, absolutely, uh, uh, you know, a kind of like, you know, a really, really, really high, surprisingly high. Uh, agreement to recon. Uh, and then the response rate at wave two, 79%, response rate at wave three, 81%. Really low attrition rates then between waves. We were re interviewing people at three monthly interviews uh, uh, on that survey. Um, and then there was also, we looked at the comparability of the telephone mode of face to face module and found really, I think. I think the conclusion to the report was that the estimates were, I know Kath was mentioning that there were lots of issues and there were lots of issues, but that was to do with, you know, the way the samples designed because we were re-interviewing people, we couldn't 
you, there weren't all 16 year olds in the sample, for instance, or very few 16 and 17 year olds. So that's why we had to, uh, you know, one of the issues was uh, that the samples, you had to use only 18 plus age groups. And we redesigned the harassment question, which I regret really uh, having, having included it. Um, so they were the issues with comparability. In relation to mode, it, it appeared that there were, there were very little um, differences. Um, on those main estimates, I, I think you, you know, uh, overall, I think we can include that. Um, and, and indeed, that's something that was reflected in the, uh, again, the American um, uh, victimization survey, who does face-to-face -face and telephone interviewing, they, they, they've done some, a, a limited amount of research, which also suggests that there's very little modal differences between at least those two modes of operation. So, Really, there's some quite positive um, lessons there about the ability to shorten the survey, um, about the sample design, about um, recontacting respondents, maybe moving to a panel survey. You know, there's, 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 lots, there's lots of, you know, valid information in there about how we might move forward um, with the survey. So... I just wanted to touch on ongoing development work. So uh, um, um, in October 2021, just recently, we awarded a research contract to Kantar for the development of uh, an online survey completion questionnaire that can be used to estimate prevalence and incidence of crime. Uh, it's a quite a large program of work um, to be conducted at PACE. Um, it starts with a rapid evidence review, which is going on at the moment. We're going to redevelop the existing script. So, so that 2018 piece of research that Kantar did on the uh, screener and victim form questions, uh, we're going to look at that, um, take on board the recommendations from that report about how those questions should be developed. Um, and then push that forward. And then we're going to do some pre-testing people with complex histories. Remember, as I said earlier, that original Kantar research showed that there were problems with complex histories, uh, you know, with people uh, um, providing incident estimation, really, in the number of incidents when they have complex histories and repeat victimization, multiple victimization, or, or, or complex crime scenarios. Um, so we're going to do some pre-testing with people around that. And then there's a, a, a quite a large scale live trial on Kantar's public voice panel where we'll be um, using the redesigned survey instrument, testing across two modes, actually telephone uh, and online. And then we're going to conduct some post hoc cognitive usability interviews. And there'll be a final report due uh, around April 2022. May 22. So there's also the ongoing development work uh, around um, um, domestic abuse. In October 2021, again, same time, we awarded a research contract to a consortium led by the University of Bristol. Um, so that um, piece of work, um, um, the main aims of that research is to understand how questions should be asked. Um, to provide the information that users need, focus on measuring controlling, coercive controlling behaviour, the impact of abuse and, and the frequency of abuse, to develop and qualitatively test survey questions with victim survivors of domestic abuse and the general public, um, to investigate the use of alternative survey modes and further examine the options and associated issues through qualitative research with victim survivors, the general public, and victim services and support providers. Um, so again, building on the research that was previously done uh, in, re in relation to domestic abuse, um, taking on board those recommendations and trying to move that, that, that work forward. And we're going to be re reporting that uh, in the spring um, of 2022. Um, the final thing is uh, just on work that's been ongoing. And um, I haven't really mentioned the survey of 10 to 15 year olds 
um, and I did want to mention it uh, just briefly, really. Um, today, really, the work uh, on crimes against children has, uh, has concentrated on assessing the feasibility of a, a separate survey measuring the prevalence of child abuse uh, uh, in the UK. Um, we conducted consultation with stakeholders on proposals for what the survey would look like in January to April uh, of this year, and we published uh, a response uh, in July. We also consulted with key stakeholders on the content of, of, of the 10 to 15 year old survey as well. Uh, and we've just now um, um, uh, given some uh, an, uh, a program of work again with, with Cantar, um, as part of the research for the main survey instrument, we're also, um, uh, we've also included uh, a piece of research which investigates how, how parents and children feel about taking part in an online 10 to 15 year old survey uh, and, uh, and how that would, should be um, conducted. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to touch on that. And, and, and of course, we'll be moving that forward over, over the next year or so. So now, just looking at future issues to address, I kind of give a, a summary of probably where we're at in terms of survey development for the Crank Survey for England and Wales. Um, I think you can see that there's been a focus of research today on, on key parts of the survey instrument, the self-completion module, looking at the ethics, looking at the type of questions do we ask, how we ask the questions, you know, looking at redesigning the questions for online or multimodal surveys, and then also looking at those other key aspects of the survey around the um, screener and victim form questions so we're looking at very and then doing some work on the children's side as well so you can see that we've kind of very focused on very some of the more i don't know some of the more important strategic i suppose parts of the survey instrument some of the more complex parts of the survey instrument some of the bits which have complex questions around it about moving to to different modes so we started doing that that work but you know there's a there's a um, there's kind of there's a lot more information and data that is carried on the survey and it's how you actually achieve that um, when operating a multimodal survey instrument and also as I was saying earlier considerations around the length of the survey and um, the other thing I suppose that we can say is that the the future development is dependent on funding um, so at the moment we know we have funding till the end of march um, there's office prioritization going on following the current spending review um, and we should know very shortly about how much um, money we get in, in in terms of redevelopment work going forward for the crime survey and, and of course, the programme of research will will very much reflect um, what what those conclusions are. So, so that that's that's another factor which we we need to take into account. On the future programme of work, I think we can say that the delivery mechanism, so the sample design, and whether we'd move to an online first survey instrument and what the issues are surrounding that haven't been addressed in the current research so there's got to be something around what response rates are like what the sample design is um, what kind of non-response bias we get from those response rates there's also a complex thing uh, other surveys um, the labor market survey um, the lms um, which is kind of like a, a, a kind of a replacement for the labour force survey, and um, that that's moved online and it has had some success. And there is one there's one big difference between the LMS and 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 the Crime Survey for England and Wales and the LFS, and that's that 
the Crime Survey for England Wellness has traditionally always interviewed only a single person in the household so that we randomly select uh, uh, one adult um, at random not once we get round to the to the address um, for online data collection that's quite complex if, you, if, if it's an online first survey you only have the path you only have a household a, a postal address that's the only thing that we use when we, we do the sample design so a, a push to web survey which uses the path you, you have to somehow contact the household and then somehow select an individual from that survey for operation and you can't do that with a well it's very difficult to do that um or think of ways of doing that in an online in an online situation and um, the scotty survey this morning the presentation and again this morning was it was interesting because of course they're going round to people's houses and then asking them to take part multimodal and that's one way that you could you could actually operate it but there's a, there's a one of one of the advantages of operating online is, is, is meant to be cost and I, I don't think you know the cost of actually sending somebody around to somebody's house asking them to take part in an online survey you, you know is, is particularly um, um, uh, effective at reducing costs uh, and then the other thing is is a panel survey the possibility of a panel survey and the tcse in the accused indicates that a panel survey has its advantages so uh, you know i think that's a, that's another thing that may well affect the 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 delivery mechanism and then the final bit as i was saying of course it is i'm just and this is just a thought really is, is do we need to make these surveys pandemic proof is it, we find out is all this going to go away in the next few years or are we is in-home interviewing something which is going to be more complex and come in and out i don't know um all i do know is that multimodal surveys seem to as i said seem to have operated or reacted to the pandemic slightly better than single mode face-to-face in-house surveys um, and as i've already mentioned then the the survey length and, and the remaining survey content and there's just some links to some of the, re the research work that we've conducted to date um, and i think i'll leave it there